Hello, everybody. Welcome to our event tonight, uh, Willie Cole and Hervé Yumbia Conversation. I'm Kimberly Dachek, the Curator of Learning and Engagement here at the Stanley Museum of Art. So as we get started, I invite you to take a moment of with me as I read the University of Iowa Acknowledgement. The University of Iowa is located on the homelands of the Ojibwe, Anishinaabe, Chippewa, Bahoji, Iowa, Chickapoo, Kickapoo, Lamet Meneawak, Menominee, Miyamaka, Miami, Natufi, Missouri, Omaha, Omaha, Wazaji, Osage, Giware, Oto, Otoba, Ottawa, Ponca, Ponca, Potawatomi, Neshnabe, Potawatomi, Meskwaki, Nemahaki, Takawaki, Dakin Fox, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, Sioux, Sanish, Nobaka, Nuweta, three affiliated tribes, and Ho Chunk, Winnebago nations. The following tribal nations Omaha, Omaha tribe of Nebraska and Iowa, Honka, Honka tribe of Nebraska, Meskwaki, Sac and Fox of the Mississippi and Iowa, and Ho Chunk, Winnebago tribe of Nebraska nations continue to thrive in the state of Iowa, and we continue to acknowledge them. As an academic institution, it is our responsibility to acknowledge the sovereignty and the, the traditional territories of these tribal nations and the treaties that were used to remove these tribal nations and the histories of dispossession that have allowed for the growth of this institution since 1847. Consistent with the university's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, understanding historical and current experiences of native peoples will help inform the work we do collectively as a university to engage in building relationships through academic scholarship, collaborative partnerships, community service, enrollment and retention efforts, acknowledging our past, our present, and future Native nations. Now I'll hand it over to Lauren Lessing, our director, to introduce our guest. Thank you, Kimberly. I'm Lauren Lessing, the director of the University of Iowa Stanley Museum of Art, and it's just a pleasure and an honor tonight to welcome you to this, e this evening to the first in a series of conversations between contemporary artists based in Africa and the Americas, funded by the Henry Luce Foundation as part of their generous support for Homecoming, the Stanley's inaugural exhibition. Tonight's conversation following presentations by our guest artists will be led by Dr. Corey Gundlach, the Stanley's curator of African art. Willie Cole is a sculptor, printer, and perceptual engineer based in New Jersey. He is currently this year's artist in residence at Express Newark. Cole works with everyday materials, irons, shoes, plastic bottles, and musical instruments. The previous lives of these objects and the experiences of those who use them inflect the sculptures and prints that he creates. The works intertwine mundane objects, routines, and habits into the realm of the sacred, ceremonial, and ritualistic. He incorporates spiritual and artistic traditions from African and American artistic and craft traditions into his work to confront contemporary concerns including the climate crisis and racism. The Stanley has two works by Cole in its collection, Men of Iron from 2004, which was on view this fall, and the recently acquired Two-Faced Blues from 2021, which is currently on view in our galleries. Hervé Yumbi lives in Cameroon. He is currently in an artist residency at the North Carolina Museum of Art in association with New Masks Now, Artists Innovating Masquerade in Contemporary West Africa, an NEH-funded exhibition that is currently in development. Yumbi often integrates traditional Cameroonian sculptural techniques with his installations and into performance and video. This allows him to juxtapose indigenous African traditions with contemporary global art conversation, art, sorry, art conventions, and to destabilize what is regarded as traditional versus contemporary. Yumbi is a founding member of Circle Kupiski, a collective of five Cameroonian visual artists established in 1998. 
The collective shares its passion for the arts with, this, with city dwellers who otherwise have little access to such things. The K Factory is also a laboratory for artists from different disciplines. It welcomes young creators interested in developing experimental forms of expression as part of a residency program in which they work with established practitioners. The Stanley's home, homecoming exhibition includes Yumbi's Bamlika Dogon Kungang mask and related materials, and that's currently on view. I hope you take a moment um, to visit the galleries and see both artists work. And now, um, please join me in welcoming the first presenter, Willie Cole. Hello, Iowa. Sounds like ayahuasca almost. Mm -hmm. But um, yes, it's great to be here. Of course, I don't know what I'm going to say, but I think I understand my mission. <laughs> So I am a visual artist. I live in Garden State, State, New Jersey. I've been making art since I was three years old. I grew up being called a little artist, so I never had any doubt about it, which has helped me as an adult. Um, I was a painter and a graphic designer because I started as an illustrator and graphic designer. Uh, then I became a painter, but I had a great friend who was a African art dealer, who, and he and I were the only ones in Newark, we thought, who didn't sleep. So I go to his studio at night, or he comes to mind. We would talk about African art. Uh, he would allow me to put on the Dan mask or blow the ivory horn, and that experience changed my life. Um, during that same time, I was reading everything by Joseph Campbell about comparative religious uh, things. I was uh, studying Christianity. I was going to Harlem to the Tree of Life bookstore, uh, studying everything about spirituality and uh, and society. And that has become a big part of my life now. So all the things you see in my work are not premeditated. It's just the flow of, of who I am and what I do. So the pieces that are in the collection here are Men of Iron, the one on the on the on your left is called Men of Iron. And Men of Iron was pretty much at that time, the last piece in a long series of works about steam irons. Steam iron work began uh, one day walking down the streets of maybe one of the most dirtiest cities in the world, Newark, New Jersey. They didn't clean the streets a lot. I always find irons on the street. So it began when I became artist in resident student museum in Harlem. And I had to catch the train to New York every day. On the way to the train station, I saw an iron on the street that had been rented by a car. And because I was so entrenched in studying African art, I saw that run of iron as, a, as an African art object, as a mask. So I brought it into my studio and, and photographed it, back in those days with a Polaroid camera. And it changed my life. You know, I, I don't know how to say it in a more realistic way or less cliche way, but it really changed my life. And it became my icon. As I said, before I was doing the irons, I was weaving strips of metal together, making clothing. Uh, I had like full metal jackets that made out of galvanized steel strips, full bodies made out of galvanized steel strips. But the iron just grabbed me in such a way that I really believed I was having a magical, as they say, a mystical, magical, musical experience. Uh, because now I was seeing scorches in my studio on the floor. I never noticed it before. I've been living there for like, be seven years before I started doing work with steam iron. And it had been a former sweatshop, but I never saw a scorch on the floor until I started making art out of steam irons. And uh, so, you know, looking at the iron and exploring the shapes and the forms and the colors, I made a list of everything that the iron consists of. So the handle was black, so that became black people. Uh, it was shaped like a boat, so that became, you know, the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, each iron brand had their own steam hole patterns that became scarification. And I just, you know, I just went, instead of going buck wild, I went scorch wild. <laughs> and I just started doing, uh, committed to that. Now, this was in the 80s. So in the 80s and pop culture, beyond visual arts, branding was a big deal, you know. So I branded myself as what I now would call a Willie the Scorch. 
and I, I worked with just steam irons for many years, probably up until 2000. Um, now, behind the scenes, I was doing paintings of my family members, portraits, and drawing cartoons, but publicly, I was only doing sculptures. So I had a short Museum of Modern Art, I think, in 1999 or maybe 2000. And I thought that was the end of scorching for me, and I should do something else. So I started doing other things, but my gallery still demanded scorches. So the scorches here, this is all done in Photoshop, because also in that year, uh, Cindy Sherman and Matthew Vardy were like real popular in New York, and they both had their own image themselves in their artwork. So I decided to put myself in my work and made this piece called Men of Iron. And um, I had several different kinds of irons because nowadays they kind of, I call these imported irons that look like uh, yachts. But back in the irons from 56s are the ones I like and they all had specific patterns. And I began to see each brand as a tribe. And these are, these are, these tribes are the African-Americans who were enslaved or in service in this country, you know, uh, prior to the Civil War. So they were the Black and Deckers, the Sunbeams, the Silexes, the GEs, the Westinghouses. Those, so this is my fantasy tribes. And I connected it to a speech by Malcolm X when Malcolm talks about the house Negro and the fuel Negro. So I, I developed the idea of the house Negro using the steam iron. So those are all house Negro tribes because in the moment of, uh, of say, a revolt on the plantation, the house Negro has weapons of defense. His shield is his ironing board. And his weapon is the iron. That. So that was, that was my fantasy. And so I built around that and created what I call the Silex Warrior and, this, and the Sunbeam Warrior. The one on the right is the Sunbeam, and one on the left is Silex. I don't have tattoos on my body. I don't definitely have scorches on my body, but it was all done in Photoshop. So that was, like I said, probably from the 89 or 88 rather to 2000. Uh, scorching on wood and canvas, uh, and I should say, before I move on to the next piece, I don't know how long I should speak, by the way, it go on forever, okay? Mm -hmm. But I should say that uh, I started with the steam iron, uh, taking the iron apart, using all those pieces to make a new thing. You know, it was kind of like, um, if you get a puzzle for Christmas, and there's no picture on the box, but you know it comes together, so that was my approach. I don't, to this day, I don't make any sketches. I tried not to even have any plans other than to be present because I believe that creativity is not coming out of me, it's coming into me. And you can only get in if I'm relaxed. If I think I know everything, then I, I know nothing. Like if I just say that's a chair, I'll never see that, you know, there's a nice piece of plastic and some metal rods that I could use. So I begin to see everything differently. Uh, in the, most extreme, I would see everything as a molecule or, or a particle. Like you all are a bunch of particles here, but you all look so different than each other. But you're the same as the chair. It's all made from the same thing. There's only one source for life, and there's only one element that life is made of. But somehow, in time and I don't know, maybe even marketing, we see different things. So I use the materials that way. I started with the scorch after making figurative images of just the irons. I was also very involved in the Yoruba traditions in those years. My wife was Yoruba. So a lot of my iron work was kind of Yoruba inspired aesthetically. So I had this little figure, you know, little power figure made from steam iron. And I asked myself, now, you know, he, he looks like a cool little sculpture. Well, what is the evidence of his power? And I decided the evidence of his power is the scorch. So that's how I got to using the hot iron to scorch a wooden canvas. Um, so that part was uh, led to everything that followed it. Like I said, prior to the iron, I did hair dryers. <laughs> and I just did found objects in general, but I made a lot of jewelry out of found objects. But when I got to the hair dryers, it was more about using a single object repeated, repeatedly, which is kind of what I do today. I, I used to call it um, minimal maximalism, uh, you know, but you know, it might just be called obsessiveness. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, 
So, so a lot happened. Like this piece, I think we should have 2004 or 2005. That piece there was from last year. So a lot happened between those those times. Uh, but the guitar pieces came about. Well, that's made out of guitars. Uh, my daughter-in-law had a friend who was a musician, and he didn't know her father-in-law was an artist. Once she told him that. He said, Yamaha has, a, Yamaha has a program where they give uh, guitars to schools for kids to paint. And, but they would maybe they'll give them to your dad. So I, you know, I got in touch with Yamaha, and uh, the, her friend was the connection. And they gave me 75 acoustic guitars to play with. And this was just at the beginning of the pandemic. I got them just before the pandemic hit, literally, maybe like a month before. So all during the pandemic, my thing is making art out of guitars. So I spent two years making uh, pieces for a show that I had just last year. And it was more about seeing than explaining. You know, I didn't approach it knowing I was going to make something of this sort or that sort. I just knew that I wanted to use all the guitars. It's another obsessive thing, I guess, is that when I have an object, I want to use them all till they're all gone. <laughs> and then I get something else. And that's been hard to do. Like in my studio now, I still have tons of steam that I haven't used. And between the guitars and the Photoshop piece there, I've done a lot of work with high heel shoes. I have millions of high heel shoes. <laughs> Even though I've made millions, well, I've made hundreds of artworks from them, I still have millions of shoes. I mean, I have a shipping container next to my barn that is filled with uh, water bottles. So uh, everything I collected just goes overboard. I have, I, I have a two-story Dutch barn on my property, and the second floor is my shoe studio. Prior to using my barn as a studio, I had a helicopter hanger. And it just rows and rows of shoes, you know, it's just... For me, it was a great experience to walk through there. And for a while, I had an assistant. I was a fellow at the University of Georgia, and I had an assistant who would tell me what each shoe was in society. Like, this is a wedding shoe. This is a graduation shoe, blah, 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 blah. So I, I, in my imagination, in my mind, and it all seems real to me anyway, these objects all have life. Uh, most of the objects I've used have had intimate contact with human beings. Um, the guitars had intimate contact with me, so I really, really love the guitar. I've had one my whole life. But the iron, uh, yeah, I was born in the 50s, so I grew up with Motown and all that stuff. So as a little kid, I ironed my shirts every morning for school. You know, you had to go to school dressed like you were in the Temptations. So everything was perfectly crisp, you know. So I was very much into irons. And before I started making art out of irons, I actually had a collection of irons because when they would break, my dad would fix them. But once my parents got divorced, that job became my job and I didn't know how to fix them. So I had a bunch of them already. Once I started making art out of them, I started seeing them on the streets all the time. So I didn't have to uh, buy them. Once I got into the art machine, I had to start buying them from the thrift stores. I needed more and more and more and more. So I was fortunate to get all those guitars from Yamaha. And I don't choose the objects. The objects choose me. Like, I don't know what's next. <laughs> um, I, I know I've had enough, but I'm always willing to go back because I still love these objects. It's, uh, my most recent object, well, currently I'm making chandeliers out of water bottles to go along Park Avenue in New York City. But up until February of this year, I was making art out of saxophones because I had a commission from uh, Kansas City, Missouri for the new airport. And Charlie Parker was born in Kansas City and he played the saxophone. And his nickname was Bird. So I said, I'm gonna make birds out of saxophones. So I, I was able to buy 300 saxophones from China, brand new saxophones. And I used 200, I have 100 left. I still have nine works in progress, but I've donated horns to some to Mayo High School, which is an art high school. And I'm donating next week, and I'm presenting uh, 10 saxophones to the to some art foundation in New York run by Ray Charles Jr. 
and I sent uh, 20 horns to Havana, Cuba. They have a program called Horns for Havana. So, you know, that's that's just the way it flows for me. I, I never know what's next. I, when I when an object finds me, we we really get close together, you know. And um, my day is the day of a kid when you get a, as I said, you get a new puzzle, and you just sit at the table and you play with it till you get it together. Uh, at one point, I called it archaeological ethnographic Dadaism because archaeological was me finding the pieces. Like in Newark, I said the streets were not that clean. It's always garbage on the street. If there was a fire, I'd go to the site of that fire, and I would always find the steam iron and the iron board and the telephone. So I started collecting those three things for, for quite a few years. Uh, ethnographic, because I was doing it in Newark, but also because my internal, I guess my genetic reference was Africa. So the art looked kind of African, but it, it wasn't so conscious and deliberate. You know, I mean, so many things, I, like I heard the introduction, everything you said is true, but it wasn't intended. It was just being, being present, being open, being aware and accepting. I mean, that's, that's the path of my life. Um, and being open is, is self-explanatory. Being aware takes a little more practice because there's so much distraction in the world. But my, my awareness has taken me to a point of like 100% confidence and faith and, and belief in myself and the things that I do. So I just float now. You know, I'm old enough to float now. I had some years of stroking, some years of dog paddling, but now I just float. Anyway, or <laughs> I'm not watching the clock. So. <laughs> yes, so thank you very much. And I can answer any questions at the end of our whole event here. Thank you. Hi, everybody. It's a real pleasure for me to be among you uh, this afternoon. I'm a real visual artist from Cameroon, and it's a real pleasure to present my work to you. As you can understand, my English is not so fluent. I speak mostly French. So most of the time, I used to help uh, to, uh, to call someone to help me translate my work. But uh, since uh, my last uh, presentation at the Mini Connection, I'm trying my best to do it myself. So yeah. I have a somebody of work to present to you. I will do it quickly because of time and try to focus on the last uh, project that is Design And uh, I choose it because um, this museum has one of the artwork produced in from that project in the collection. So uh, the first artwork will be Trans Africa. I don't know if I should read, you can read it, then I follow the comment, okay? To realize that artwork, I was inspired by some, uh, two types of artwork. The first was painting, maybe very classic one, that you can see. And there is a fabric on which we have the image of Jesus Christ using in history of, uh, let's say, um, really religious painting, talking about uh, um, Christianity. We also have the same thing in photography, uh, making in Africa by photo, African photographs from 1950 to 1970. I found very uh, interesting and uh, theatry. That's the way to make a photography. You have the personal, the central person of the photography. You have person who holds the, uh, the background, and sometimes the landscape after the background, and the garage hold everything, you know. And I think I, I found it very interesting. So I was inspired by that, uh, those two artwork to realize the, the theme of my painting. Here we have, uh, it's a triptych. You are going to see all the pieces at the, at the end. 
And here you have this three consultation between uh, uh, the president. Here in this first painting, you have Amadou Indo and Paul Bia, who is the actual president of Cameroon. So what are the only president we have in Cameroon since 1950? And then uh, in the fabric, we can see the logo of the two, uh, let's say, um, political party belonging to, the, to, to both of them. TPDM is the party of, uh, created by, founded by uh, Paul Bia, the one. Uh, and then uh, UNC is the party created by Aido, but normally it's the same, same party. When Aido was president, he created, he founded uh, UNC. And then uh, when Paul Bia arrived at the heart problem, he changed because Aido remained the president of the party, but not the head of the state. So it was a little bit a conflict. So a conflict brings Paul Bia to change the look of the party and create a new party was TBGM, but it was the same or statue of, of party. Yeah. Here you have uh, um, the painting that highlights the strong partnership between France and African country, because France was um, the country who colonized 70 African countries. And here you have uh, Valéry Giscard d'Estaing, French, uh, French president um, at the end of 70, at the beginning of 80. And on that, you have uh, Jean Bédel Bokassa, who was president in South Africa. And uh, both of them was closely French, but uh, the Valéry Giscard d'Estaing helped Bokassa to be emperor. And at the end, he was the one who created a putsch and removed him and chose his cousin as president. And Bukasa, very angry, talked a lot about the, 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 the question of the diamond he offered to Valéry Giscard d'Estaing, and that story made him lose the second election, yeah, the presidency. Here we have the confrontation between Compaoré and Sankara. And we know the history. Yeah. So the fabric is just used with a particular fabric uh, initiated and by uh, Sankara to be, he was talking about using product of Burkina to, um, yeah, as clothes to create, to design pressing and on, uh, let's say, to, he tried to say consume Burkina Bay, but to use things belonging to Burkina Faso for the daily life and not just be dependent of things coming from the West. Yeah. Um, so the fabric is the symbol of, of that notion of, uh, of uh, Sankara. But we know what happened because he was killed and it's clearly, um, uh, yeah, it's clear that Compaoré was close friend to him, was part also of what happened. So you have the fetish and uh, at South Africa who highlight that situation, the situation of the strong uh, impact of France as country, uh, colonizer, you say in English, I don't know what you can say, colonizer, yeah, sorry, thank you, colonizer against the 70 countries who were under his control during the period of uh, colonization. But I think that looks like it remains the notion of colonization. So this uh, painting was made to highlight that situation for a particular exhibition, uh, let's say, organized by the curator who was Simut Ogosubu Zewi, actually curator of African art in Adboma. This was in 2019. We have the second project, Ono du Père.
it's also a critique that is a photographic artwork. Yeah. And here I was myself part of the creation. This painting looks like the official painting of someone who was just elected as president of the state. The flag we have behind is the flag of the uh, Union, African Union. I choose that flag because the um, situation I'm highlighting in this, thing, this uh, work, it's a situation that happened in all the continents. It's, it's, yeah. The first image, we have it in background, in the second image. And in this image, I have a with my key. And the image you have there, it is image that represents, uh, let's say, um, the notion of uh, heritage or uh, testimony used by most of the king in West region of Cameroon uh, for several years. The person who is sitting in the image, the photography there, black and white, he was is the former king of Pondanti village. And the guy at the right, it's his son. He's the actual king of Pondanti village, the guy at the right. And uh, most of the time, uh, the king used to make a photograph with one of his son and just give it to some person to keep it closely. And then those person can bring it when he has passed away as a uh, symbol of his choice, of his successor. So we can find such situation also in our days. Uh, I think when I realized this artwork in uh, 1911, uh, there, there was a summary uh, of J, J9, J9, I think something like that. And uh, some president was, were invited to take part at it. Uh, the president of Senegal by that time, Abdullah Wad, was among those presidents. And after the, the, the speech and order, we can found, we can see to the CV, the president of Senegal, Abdullah Wad, presenting his son to all of the powerful, powerful men of, of the world. So for me, it's a, an expression of the, yes, yes, the, the presentation of his successor. And I think that he lose the election because of that at Senegal. Yeah. Because Senegalese said, no, can't agree to have Karim after you, Karim your son as president. So in this uh, third picture, you have uh, my son. And then at the background, you have the same image of uh, the, his father. It's the way, way to represent his father as a strong symbol of the regime that remained, you know. In this situation, the sun is just like a puppet of a system that, that, that directs the country. And I'm talking about it. This was made in 2011, but actually in Cameroon, we are really uh, afraid about this situation because it will happen. So this is a quick issue. The next installation is Alo Alo. I was invited to um, Netherlands for a Genali intitled uh, Art of the Into Nature, Art of the Darkness. That was the title of the, the event. And uh, the project I chose to present was uh, to set up a dialogue between a funeral monument from Neolithic, who was a dolmen, in front of a, let's say, um, contemporary art funerary made by me. 
So I was surprised by Alo Alo, who are the, the funerary monument from Madagascar, from Mahafali people at the south of uh, Madagascar, Islam in, in Africa. And uh, most of the time, Alo Alo is a column of wood sculpture on top of which you can find figure. Those figures tell a lot about the situation of the person who died. Uh, you can see here uh, his name. So he was traveling a lot. Yeah. Uh, Kao, he was a rich man and so thing. And for me, it was important to make such thing, but not to make a copy of Alaro that exists in Madagascar. For me, I need to, let's say, bring several elements of, uh, because in Africa, you have a very great, um, let's say, uh, traditional practice of uh, column, funerary column in several countries in Africa. So for me, it was very really interesting to make a, you say, French calendar, although it's the, the, the similarity in English, so to, to be inspired by what exists to create a new one. And also to make a, to, let's say, um, to use the megalithic object we can found in the, in the world, in my sculpture. So you can found, for example, at the mid, the first one, white, you have, uh, the, the beast of the past Islam. I don't even know the sculpture. You can also find there, the last there, the, uh, the deep uh, white, you have the head, all make head, a uh, head from uh, Mexico. And here you can find the head of uh, Spain at Egypt. So most of those artwork are megalithic creation, uh, realization. So for me, it was very important to bring all those things in front of the dolmen in uh, Neterman. So this was the result of the artwork. So I used beet, uh, wood, sculptural wood, covered with beet. Uh, under the, the sculpture, you have stone. And you have the relationship between biggest wood and little stone in my realization that in order in the dolmen, you used to have Bigger stone and little wood and sand, but with the time, the wood and the sand grew up and it just remain uh, the stone. The very interesting thing is that at something like, um, uh, let's say, uh, 10 past four, the shadow of one sculpture touched the stone because they told me that I don't have to. Let's say to put my installation close to the stone to protect the stone if one of the, the column falls. Yeah. And uh, I learned by making research about the, the dolmen that to choose the entrance of the dolmen, uh, the people of the used to um, play with the movement of the sun. So for me, it was also very important in my work to play with that element. So uh, the shadow of my monument cannot damage the stone. So it established a strong direct relationship between both uh, funerary monument, one for the Olympic and the other for, for our circle. Yeah. And um, I should notice also to end with that uh, presentation for the presentation of this work that Alo Alo is the name of the uh, funerary monument in Madagascar, Islam, but Alo Alo is also the one of the word more used in the world in our day. It's the word that we use to open the conversation. And in that uh, situation, we are talking about the conversation between two monuments, funerary monuments. So after uh, all things there, that space at the deep north of the the Netherlands, the work was uh, on display at uh, Paris, at uh, Strasbourg, at uh, La Chauterie. It's the gallery of um, uh, the Ile, the Haute Ecole des Arts Girons, so at Strasbourg, France. And then after that, uh, last year, it was on display at the uh, Cape Grand Museum. Yeah. Exotic autochtone, the clone celeste.
to this hard work, I was invited to create, uh, to make a proposal of artwork about the notion of uh, restitution, yeah, of patrimony, African patrimony from museum in the West. So the idea was to, I selected uh, five famous figure of uh, African classic artwork that was floating on the space, on the space on top of uh, four, five bases made by wood and covered with Nero. Yeah. And uh, you have it, it was at the center of a triangle made by great with image of the mask that you can found in several uh, collections, visual and private in the West, that means Europe or US. So here you have image of the world uh, on display at the um, Cité International des Arts in Paris, that was last year. So people were looking at the image because you have a sentence writing this. The images was, you have image of mask and then you have the title, uh, the origin of the mask, um, the information about the size, uh, things used to realize the mask, but sometimes also the itinerary of the mask from the, from Africa to where the mask is. So this was the pieces choose to be realized. And then under each pieces, you have a sentence. And to read the sentence, you need the mirror to read the sentence. So this is the sentence, it was in French, so this is the translation in English. So for me, it was very really important to highlight, uh, let's say, five, um, uh, yeah, five things that are coming up when people are talking, mostly in Africa, when Africans talk about that question, what is their, what, what they think about that question. So for me, it was really important to highlight it and to share it with people. But in this way, to uh, allow the, to make that the sculpture be in conversation with the public. So when you read the sentence, like this, the, it's the sculpture that express the sentence, yeah. So the conversation between the, 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 the sculpture and the visitor. Celestial Throne is another project similar. The work is actually on display at the Menil collection at Houston. Yeah. So I was inspired by five tone, the aesthetic of the tone in West Region in Cameroon, that designed a new, a new tone. And uh, it was shown for the first time in National Museum in Cameroon to and highlight some the situation of heritage, yeah, and notion of good governance. At the same thing, you have sentence on the stone that can be read to the reflection of the mirror yeah, of the basis. This sentence, for example, our president has 90 year old. And this president says, 1982. So sometimes you can find that this close collaborator started to have some independence action you know, against him and it was some kind of reaction. So 
I use, um, let's say, um, five, five stone, five sentences to highlight also the five situation, political situation in, in the country by that time, it was in 2019. The last project, Visage the Mask. During a particular event at West Division of Cameroon, and I'm from the West Division of Cameroon, I discovered a spray mask using there. Uh, and I asked myself, what's the rule of this mask here? <laughs> it was really a shock for me to, to discover this mask there because I, I, I knew that this mask was designed by a um, friend, a European designer. He was for sure inspired by the best central personal of a painting uh, screen of Edmund Munch and then made in, in China for a, an event, cultural event here in US that the Aloe and West Haven, the filmmaker making him really uh, famous. And so why this mask should be, could be used in West region? Yeah. So I decided to maybe uh, create some mask, but the hybrid mask to, let's say, um, as contemporary artists to try and use the mask, the spray mask, but to use it in another way. So this was at the middle, you have the proposal of what I did from the spray mask and the Kungan, the mask of Kungan society in the West region of Cambridge. The same thing here with a dogon mask, monkey dogon mask, and the Kungan society, that's the result for the basis of the mask. To realize it, I decided to, uh, let's say, um, collaborate with the handcraft men in West region of Cameroon because uh, they are really talented, but their talent is just used to make serial copy of the famous artwork. We can classical African artwork, we can found here in the West, that I means in Europe or in the US. So it was probably really important to collaborate with them, to invite them as art craftsmen to be part of the creation of a contemporary artwork. You have so uh, the leader, Mama Kwam, leading one of my pieces. Another leader, because you have two ways to give pieces. The first is to cover the wood sculpture with a fabric, and then to show the deed on those that on the fabric. And the second is, is this, you just have to glue it on the wood and then uh, use the mastic to fix it. Yeah. Here we have the pieces in the collection of the museum. Yeah. yeah and uh, Papa Frederic Petit in action. So he's also a member of Kunga Society. He used to design a classic aesthetic of Kungan mask. So it's, the presentation here is to fix the dreadlocks on the mask. So he's the one who collaborates at the direction of the mask. After realizing, realizing the, the object, for me it was very important to not just have the object of display because the mask as object of exhibition is the heritage of colonization. Before the colonization, the mask was not used as object of, of exhibition. So I told to myself, as contemporary artists, if I deal with the mask, I need to, of course, to, to, ex yeah, to, to display the mask in contemporary art scene, but also to make it to be able to go back to a ritual uh, universe, to be drive like ritual object. And after the restoration of mask, I went and see some of the elder of the elder of the confrere of Kunga society to discuss with them to see if my mask is could be agreed in the society. Yeah. So this is Mr. John um, Taku, like a general of the confrere at Balasi village. 
He told me that my mask can be used, but he can give me the authorization. I need to meet the king. So this is the young king of Ballast Village, who is a lawyer. And I was lucky because he had the mind open and then uh, he understood very well what I was talking about and he gave me the authorization. That's why the mask was used finally. So here we have two aesthetic of mask. The, the first one I did and a classical aesthetic of uh, Kunga mask. This is the mask on display at Banjul Station um, at the uh, West Region in Temerun. For me, it was very important to start by to make the mask to be displayed in contemporary art scene first, and then go back to Richard Universe to make the opposite of the way that most of the masks we found in museum in collection there used. They start their life as object of ritual object of object of cheap country, then end as object of exhibition in museum. So to do the opposite was for me a symbolic way to make a reparation. What happened? Yeah, it was in uh, Quatapori Art Center at Douala. Douala. So this is the mask he used or drive in Richard Universe. The first one, it was in May, uh, in, in the, the 13th of March, 2015. So after that, the mask went out for a show at um, London, and he took the aspect of an installation. This is an installation uh, at the New York Museum. The one we have in this museum, I want museum, yeah. So this is the one at uh, display at uh, the Menil collection. And as we can see, you have a video showing the mask driving in Richard Universe. And under the, the box is this glass, you have the shipment documentation of the, because to, to, let's say, to allow the mask to move from one point to another, we need some authorization. So I need to, to make those process, to make it be able to, to move. You have the label, so two labels. One, which is close to a contemporary art label, uh, label in contemporary art uh, museum, and one not another, who is like a label in a ethnographic museum to show the ambivalency of the artwork and the ritual object and uh, contemporary artwork. You have also field photography because I place the role of ethnographer that document this artwork being performed in Richard Universe by the member of Kunga Society. Boxes with the stamp that allow to travel. And uh, for the end, I have uh, those uh, masks who are from another country, the two masks. Box was introduced in Richard Universe for the first time in December. So after the Kunga Society, I start make the same project in the member of uh, SOAP. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, both of you, for these wonderful presentations. It's an honor to be with you and to have your work in the Stanley Museum of Art. Um, one of my original questions that I wanted to pose to both of you was um, this engagement that you both have with historical African art and the way it belongs in your contemporary practice. Um, it's it's most evident, Willie, in your work in masks with high heel shoes and um, some of your bronze works, and Hervé, the way in which you borrow things throughout Central and West Africa for all of your your sculptural works. Um, so my first question is, what that relationship with those types of objects means to you in your practice? One of the biggest questions people have about 
African American Museum is why it's here. And so um, the reason why I pursued these, these acquisitions for this museum is because the way you as artists are engaging with these historical objects as the basis for some, some, of, your, some of your own work. So um, that's where I'd like to begin, how, how that work, what it means to you on a personal level. And in that relationship, what are your goals in a more social context for the public and the museum? <laughs> Just a small question. Um, like I said during my spiel here that, you know, African-Americans, have evolved from being colored to being Negro, to being Afro-Americans, to being African-Americans, but it's all been a quest for identity. I lived in Newark in the 60s, I was in high school, 60s in the early 70s. And there was a big, what I call the cultural revolution where everybody was wearing African clothes and, we were speaking Swahili, you see someone in the street, you say Abarigani, you know, instead of Edo. You know. So the quest for identity was so strong that it just became a part of who I am. So in my work, it just flows. Like I said, I I don't I don't choose uh I really, really don't choose much of anything, but it's just the awareness of who I am and where I am. That makes it want to flow. Like I, I don't even have a message I can say. I'm trying to say this. I'm trying to say that. I am just allowing a certain energy to flow through me, and once that energy gets in me, it goes to all my social political filters and comes out a particular way. So, so um, uh, I can say that um, some specialists. From West, they used to say that um, the authentic African visual African mass stopped to exist after the colonization. And for me, it's a war. It's war because the mass is invented in Africa by Africans for their news and their belief and used by them in Africa. So if the mask is made and used in that way for the same reason they need to use it, it's potential. So someone far away can't just say that it's not more authentic because uh, it was authentic where the origin was not never arrived in Africa. As they only arrived, everything authentic is here. You don't have any more authentic object in Africa. So for me, um, I wanted to try to, let's say, um, to break that idea. And uh, that's one of the things that pushed me to deal with the map. Because as contemporary artist, first of all, in 2000, I was not really agreed to be part of uh, mask to, to deal with mask because it was easy to be identified as African artists creating mask. You know, mask is the first um, art object coming from Africa who was worldwide recognized. So it was something easy for an artist to identify himself as African artist by creating mask. So for me, it was not uh, the case. I need to be identified as a contemporary artist just not contemporary artists from Africa. You know. But it's such situation, and the words I explained, seeing the, the screen art using visual images, I asked myself some questions. The first question was, what this art is he doing here? And the, the, the second was, um, yes, uh, is that mean that people who create those masks are not anymore there? And the third question was, as contemporary artist myself, if they ask me what was my contribution to help the aesthetic of the mask in ritual universe, go, go ahead, because I'm from West region. I used to travel there to be part of events. So what is my answer? So I decided to 
deal with the mass, but to do it in the, let's say, uh, the goal to push the boundaries. That's why, for example, uh, I'm really happy to see that in our days, my mass can travel from one side to another. And also, the same specialists used to build a strong wall against what is classic uh, ritual object and what is contemporary artwork. But with this project, the wall, the strong wall, fall. That means my artwork can easily move from one side to another. And yeah, so that, uh, that's my answer. Another thing, um, this is working. So, really, with your work, Men of Iron, and also um, Hervé, your work, your, your Visage de Masque series, there's definitely a focus on pushing against or blurring boundaries. And in conversation earlier, Willie, you mentioned how um, books on African art are some of your source materials, and at least for the aesthetics that you see at work in Men of, Men of Iron. Um, so I'm thinking about the, the sort of categories and labels involved that you're engaging with in, in Men of Iron, and also Hervé, the, your decision to use specific references to things like Dogon and Bamaleke, these are references to classical forms of African art and you're drawing from textbooks on classical forms of African art. Can you talk a little bit about the specific examples or the, the problems that you see that you're confronting in your work with these, you know, you're pointing directly at Dogon masks, for example, you're pointing to problems that you've found in, um, maybe not problems, but challenges perhaps you find in textbooks on African art. And of course, you know, this is a very biased question for me, as the curator of African art in bringing in work that confronts some of these problems. So um, is there some things you can you can talk about in that context? And I'm looking at the wrong questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, I mentioned earlier that I had a friend who was an art dealer. Right, art dealer African art. So I had a personal experience with uh, being able to blow a uh, heavy horn or burn Also, I grew up in the city of Newark. When I was a kid, they had a giant number, right? Huge walking museum was right there. So that awareness was has been growing with me my entire life. And uh, nowadays, I think there's a lot of genetic memory. You know, like, and my goal was having my goal was to collapse time to make the past, the present, and the future all one moment. So by having an aesthetic that was not from today, it it uh, it's fuel for that kind of awareness that you know time is only now. You look at something, it looks like it's from the past, the future, but you see it in the present. Um, the men of iron it looks that way, pretty much like what you said. I wanted to wanted to show it in a way that it would be shown in a textbook. Um, you know, I wanted to show different tribes, different ceremonies, all the way that it presented in books, because uh, other than my hands-on experience, that was how I discovered, discovered the African aesthetic in art. So, so yeah. I just uh, want to key in on, on this transition and the politicization of the word tribe in in Africa and the way that figures in, in Hervé's work and the use of that word in um, in America in a different context and there's definitely um, there's a, there's differences at work and um, I think that's a perfect transition for Hervé in, in terms of how you use these references in relation to the word tribe. I should, before I pass, I should just say that they hold the title of African American. I did ask myself, what does that really mean? Mm -hmm. Because I grew up being a human being, but then people with labels on it. So mm -hmm. in my work, I did in the beginning, like in the early 80s, think about a lot about the juxtaposition of more African and American. By, by realizing um, hybrid mask uh, for me means 
let me brief the uh, some conception of uh, West about African culture and how things uh, were done. And um, the West West people arrived in Africa and looked Africa like a continent with many tribes, you know, in the territory. And um, Dogo, Shukwe, Tulu, Badimiki, uh, Dang, and, and for me, uh, I noticed that they use that notion of tribe, of group of people, to, let's say, uh, divide up, to keep, manage the country or uh, the country where they, they were. And uh, you can find that situation even in nowadays. You cannot find a, let's say, a, a strong uh, confrontation between uh, people for several groups in Africa uh, out of the, that, during the moment of the presidential election. Because the president, the origin of the president will be against the origin of the main uh, challenger, you know, and it's used to divide people and to keep the control of the country. And for me, it was very important to try to break that thing and to realize how this must, that means to add mass coming from several parts of the continent in one and to make it exist. And I think the, the, it's also part of the dream of Africa in nowadays to have uh, something like a United States of, of the continent of Africa. Yeah, I think our dream, dream for people who are really uh, positive in the continent in our day, that is our dream to be uh, together and to be more stronger, you know. And for me, by reali realizing a bit that and following that, uh, yeah, that, that, that idea, that idea. And um, I, we are going to have something that I maybe forgot. I don't know if you come after. Yeah, maybe after. <laughs> I have no, no, no something to have, but yeah, I don't have sure. to buy one. I want to say, folks, yes. That was the goal of Malcolm X and people who met him, was to see a united Africa that included African Americans. You know, he created an organization, the OAU, for that purpose. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> I have plenty of questions, but I want to make sure the audience has an opportunity to offer your own questions. This is a, a, a great opportunity to engage directly with Lily and Hervé about their work. Um, as you're thinking about questions, the next one I have is, um, what do you see as the greatest opportunities that um, museums can provide for your goals as an artist with, with all of these these ideas that are, are at work in in your artwork. Um, and we talked about restitution and, you know, there's various ways that you approach that and you raise your finger, so. Yeah, uh, I, I, I remember now what I was. <laughs> uh, it's also that most of the, uh, let's say, um, uh, professional, most of the time, the ethnographer, ethnographer, mm -hmm. yeah, used to argue that uh, that notion of one style, one uh, one tribe, and it's a fake information. So by mixing elements from several uh, parts of the continent, I try to you know to to, to break down that notion to know that people to to let people understand that by that time people travel, artists travel and collaborate each other in all the continent. So the idea of one uh, trial, one style is really wrong. So, yeah, yeah. But to answer, to follow up and answer your, your, your question, um, when I started working on that project, for me, it was really important to uh, let the object move, as I explained in, during the presentation of the project uh, design journal. And that was the first challenge. But the second challenge now is to let's say, uh, invite the museum who have collected the mask of that project 
to bring it back to Cameroon to be planned in future you know, and come back in the middle. Because in nowadays you have artwork from the, the Africa in many um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, within, uh, Permanent collections. Yeah, not I want the, the place where they the keep the piece. collection storage. Yeah, yeah, this is the storage that yeah. at the collective storage, and they are just they are just there. They are not moved anymore, they are not uh, anymore alive. So it could be very interesting if, for example, the Bangladeshi government we have in the museum here. After it times, it's on display actually. It's normal. But after that exhibition, not to spend something like 10 years in the, in the storage of the museum, it can go back to Cameroon, continue to be right there, and then return when the museum needs it for, 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 for energy. That will be really dynamic, you know. And uh, if such uh, such project happen. We will not more talk about electrification. If object can move, yeah. So I don't know what the African American version of that would be. <laughs> the work to the artist, I like that a lot. Uh, what what role does the museum play? What they can do? I, I think what you're doing is, I think, the fact that you have bridged the diaspora and you have us here together. Yeah. Uh, but the real mission and the, and the strangeness of it all is that our audience does not have more people of color. I'm not sure how you can do that, but I feel that's an important thing. You can hear me without this. <laughs> uh, yeah, this kind of presentation, even just meeting an artist from the continent, I am an ambassador for a program called the Resilient in Angola. And my mission is to help the Angola artists reach a bigger audience. But the, the back and forth of the project is that they also want to bring artists from the US to Angola to interact with those artists. And I'm still working on, because the person that started the United Nations uh, American school, he knows nothing about art or their business. <laughs> challenge of that is that it's hard to make it as an artist. You have to want it. You have to decide and believe the level that you choose to live on and be part of because you're an artist, whether you are showing your work or something, just making it makes you an artist. But what do you expect to come from that? So your idea of back and forth is, is a great idea. And that's like, that idea to me contains the idea of art first. The art is more important than the audience. And uh, I like that too, because I, I think of my work as a lie. Like I'm making something to get it to the point where I can just pass it off to God, to breathe on it, and bring it to life. And, um, that's what you'll be doing, passing it back. <laughs> you know, I just want to recognize this this importance of the idea of flow in, in you as an artist and your interest in mobility. And, you know, there's a vitality there. And I can't help but recognize the parallel to Tina Camp's recent book of Black Gaze and how flow is the common thread in contemporary Black artistic expression. And I see that relationship between mobility and flow. And I mean, you've talked about in your own past interviews that I've watched how Black culture is just the foundation for so much innovation in the art world. And this uh, basis of flow and mobility seems to be a, a common thread there. And that's I how think that, that concept is valuable for life. Yeah. Like we are all living in our defined find them. But we have tend to be so much more than that. If we just relax. I can talk about that deeper, but I don't want to get too clear. <laughs> I am I am a person who lives more inside than outside. That doesn't mean being isolated alone. It just means recognize that this body you see is not the voice you hear. You know what I mean? 
<laughs> Spirit is the speaker. He's just like, I'm the car, but I'm not the driver. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions from our audience? Um, I'm a semi retired physical therapist. I've been in the beginning, but this is really interesting now in the environment to start coming here because I was, I was too busy working with the youth to get them up coming in. So. And a friend of mine, where I, oh, I'm sorry. A friend where I live was going to come tonight, but she had medical tests. We're, we're coming Saturday. How long is this stuff here to look at? Oh, it's in the permanent collection. Yeah. So we have uh, work by both artists in the museum permanently. Oh, permanently. Permanently. Oh, that is nice. Yes. I thought there was a time. And I also have a grandson that's a senior, going to be a senior at West next year. And he's always been very artistic. And I'm trying to start a college fund for him. So this is why I'm interested too. So I'd like to bring them here too sometime. Now that I know where you're located, because I moved away for about 10 years. And I was going to go to something last week. And it was I was at the wrong place by the pantry. <laughs> but this is a beautiful building. I'm glad I came tonight anyway. Oh, glad to have you. Yeah. And the other, let's see, I can read my. Oh, I wondered how heavy those masks are with all the dreadlocks and stuff. And do they have air vents so they don't get too hot in them? Those are really neat. What the, oh, the dreadlock uh, mask? Oh, no, it's not too heavy. It's not too heavy. No, not heavy. No, 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 no. Okay. The, the dreadlock is made with uh, human hair. Uh huh. Yeah. And the, yeah, the, the mask itself is wood covered with leaves. So it's not really. Yeah. What kind of wood is used? For uh, the name in French is Medina. I don't know how to say it. It's not really piece, but yeah. it's not, it's, but a lighter wood that you can uh, carve and do stuff. Yeah. Here, I call them totem poles, but those are really pretty too. Yeah. They remind me of the old Indian totem poles. Those are really neat too. And your thing about recycling, I mean, how do you make a plastic water bottle chandelier? That's wonderful. <laughs> well, I, well, I mean, it's your problem. You know, it's your inspired by African art. Yeah, it's really neat. I was in South Africa one summer and I bought a beaded chicken. Uh huh. It's one of the big tourist things you can see at the airport, even gift shops all over, all over Cape Town. And I realized that the beaded chicken was actually a wire sculpture covered with beads, so beads on wire. So that's what my my word about sculpture are just wire with the bottles. It's basically big bead, big bead sculptures. Mm -hmm. And the bottle itself is just so seductive. You look at a plastic bottle in sunlight, it sparkles like a diamond. And so it was it was perfect material to uh -huh. to express spirituality. I can't wait to see this stuff. You can go online. Yeah. Go Woody. And the other question I have is that appearance of floating. Are there like fine wires or how? I mean, that's your secret probably, but it's such an illusion. No, no, it's just a, it was just a pen from the ceiling. Yeah. From the ceiling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions from the audience? Um, I had a question concerning, um, you mentioned that the art is more important than the audience. And I was wondering if you would ever present your art in a French museum. And if so, do you think that it will have an effect on your message and in what way? Both. <laughs> Both. Yeah. My work is currently showing at the Pompidou Center in Paris. You know, art is an international business, so we show it we show wherever we can. We're forced that we get to show all over the world. And then my show in uh, the Pompidou was uh, like one of those Afro futurism shows. <laughs> so, so it's the... I never understood the word the question. I was thinking that it was for him. So, what's the question, please? With, um, this is mostly geared towards your presentation of how the French influence on African societies and in the like. President, considering like the politics and all, do you think that you would ever present your art in the in any French museum? Of course, why not? You already asked. Why not? The work, the, that work, the photography, uh, was present for the first time at Dakar dinner. It's true that one uh, friend of mine told me that uh, if uh, what 
remain president, it will be difficult to that that work should be selected. You know. But if he's not president, maybe you can win the the the, the, the real prize at Dakar. That was his idea. But yes, I showed the work at Dakar. I showed it in, in Cameroon. Voila. Yeah, well, so you think there's a political act to not show in colonizer's country? Yeah, Is that your location? Yes, in a way, considering the history behind what the art is showing and what the art is representing, I wondered if showing it in a, the colonizer's country, if that would affect any part of the message or if that was like a standpoint. Well, that, ex that extends the lesson to everybody, <laughs> the colonizers as well as the colonizers. Mm -hmm. Teaching students. You know, through our, our artworks, so the, we, we, we ask questions and we invite people to speak about what happened to me by figuring those two persons, for example, Aijo and Bolvia. It's a question to the audience also. It's a question to know more about what happened against those two persons. Because sometimes the history is not really right, you know, not really tell it. So we need to know what happened. And the specialist should tell more about what happened in such situations. So sometimes it's just a, a way to um, give the audience the opportunity to talk about that situation, to question yourself, to interrogate yourself, to communicate to the subject of the, the, the artwork. And I want to bring that back to this American scene where every February, all over the country, there are Black History Month shows where Black artists get to show their work. So curators, I want to see a Black History Month show where all the artists are white. <laughs> I think that would be powerful because, you know, of course, Black history is American history. But, you know, America is not all Black, so mm -hmm. I really want to see that kind of show one day. Hopefully soon. <laughs> I had a, a white South African friend who couldn't get in an in a African uh, a Black History Month show because he wasn't Black. But his work, he was an African. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. Hi, thank you so much for coming. Um, I have um, separate questions for each person, but um, so I'll ask them together, but then you can answer separately. Um, just hearing your talks and um, listening to what resonates with you, Willie, I'm wondering, um, are there things that are currently that you're reading that are inspiring you? Because it seems like reading is a big part and like going through books and, and um, doing that work through text and through image is very important to you. So are there just any, things that you're reading right now that are currently inspiring you. Um, and then for everybody, um, I was wondering a little bit more about what the conversation between um, uh, museum and accepting a work and you saying these are the conditions on which you have to accept the work, what that looked like, and if there was any pushback or resistance where a curator or someone in the museum might say, well, I don't know if we can like do that according to your terms, but maybe these are possible. Is it like a dialogue? Um, is it like a decision where sometimes you have to say, I'm not going to let you have my piece or I'll let you have my piece, even though, you know, we can't necessarily negotiate um, bringing these items back, what what does that look like? So yeah, however you guys want to answer those. I don't read a lot about art anymore. I mean, I've been doing this my whole life, you know, so I am interested more in spirituality than art. So Absolutely. The, books, the books I'm reading now are spirituality and human potential, not about art. That's fine. What is what are those? Oh, <laughs> I'm rereading a book in the 70s. 
Hey, I met this this old guy, bearded, long hair guy in a long robe named Papa Joe. <laughs> and I started studying the Bible with him in those years. So I was feeling, I was feeling pretty magnetic. And I found a book in the incinerator room of my apartment building called Three Magic Words. It was written in the 60s. And uh, all the references in the book are references in the Bible, pretty much stating that the human potential is what Christ is an example of. So you know, everybody is worshiping Christ like he's God. And Christ says, you know, you can't get to, to the Father except through me or I am the way. That's just saying what I am is what you are. You just have to recognize it in yourself, the human potential. So this book is about that. I started listening to a book on uh, Audible called The Master Key System from 1921. It's on the same topic. So that's pretty much what I've been into the past couple of weeks. Yes, when I started that project, to be honest, uh, the idea to see one of the artworks to be acquired by the museum was not on the program. Uh, the first idea was to bring in virtual universe in West Region and not, not just in West Region, but maybe out of Tenero because I already initiated the project in Senegal also in um, So the, the idea was to bring more and more new body of art work, virtual art work in those space in Africa. And um, of course, to allow them to travel and come back, as uh, I'm doing actually with uh, the throne that so uh, I showed the installation, the throne tennis, those uh, throne floating on the yeah. And people asked many people of let's say these young who are really interested about that work, I wanted to acquire the artwork. But I said no, it's not on sale. <laughs> because I made the exhibition for the first time in National Museum of Cameroon, and then I decided, my guardian told me that there's an interest for the artwork. How we do? I said, no, no, no. This album will go back to West Region. I will make a gift to the king, five king in West Region of Cameroon. So I did it. And then I decided to not sell those albums. And now they are on display at um, the Menil Collection at Houston. And after the show, they go back to the owner king. You know, mm -hmm. it could be the same thing with the mask. Yeah. But, um, People told me that if you don't think at the economic aspect of the work, maybe after you, people will think at it. So it's better for you to establish the rule yourselves. So I started working on it. And then, then, then it was possible to acquire the artwork. And the idea was that if one artwork is acquired, the twins or a sister thesis should be made to remain in ritual universe so that they will not remove something, you know. Uh, and uh, so for me, that's what happened. And now I'm, I'm trying, and when you are interested about the other one, we let you know that we are interested to, to bring it back if possible. You know that it's not uh, always uh, easy for museum, uh, let's say, direction to decide to send back a work like that because uh, they have such. Uh, yeah, it's difficult for them, but I think that it's possible to understand what's going on and I'm, I'm still alive. Those with whom I collaborate to realize the artwork are there. The name, it's mentioned on the, 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 the label, so they can be identified. So if there's a problem, they can arrange them. No problem. So that, that's why um, we allow that. But I want to notice something also by um, allow the mass to be acquired by museum and a lot the project also. Because it's the, uh, let's say, uh, personal finance, the realization of our work. Uh, I live in Douala, so I need to make, let's say, six hours by car to reach the cover with at Kumban. Mm -hmm. Let's say, uh, five hours to reach the leader, no problem at that. And uh, four hours to reach uh, Papa Federico Pedro to realize the, 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 the metros. So I used to spend time, spend money, sometimes I travel with a team to document the work. Because I'm working on the 
documentary film on the project that will be part of the uh, project new mask now. Yeah. So by sending the mask, I was able to make more masks and also to uh, express my let's say um, my happiness for the notion of collaboration with the member of the society. So I should precise that uh, in our days, the project helped the society to build the house of the meeting. It helped the, 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 uh, the village to arrange the road, help the village to, let's say, uh, create electricity. In Balasti village, for example, when I started the program, there were no electricity in Balasti. You know, so it helped to bring electricity in the village, such thing. So yeah. it's helpful. We are not, it's not an obligation to bring the mass back. But if it's happened, it could be great. Yeah. You know, we have something similar, but mine is more commercial. <laughs> so most of my work is taken by my galleries on consignment. And uh, they may exhibit for a month and then they put it in storage. And then I ask for it back. If they don't sell it with a certain time, I ask for it back. But it's not a continuous back and forth flow. Mm -hmm. I think I have, I think Peter Norton, he's Norton's antivirus, one of my biggest collectors. And I can't imagine saying, Peter, let me add it back for a while. <laughs> But what I have done, I've made, as you say, copies, replicas, duplicates of things, just so I have. And now with 3D printing, like I have a piece at the New York Museum. It's, uh, I found it recently that it looks like something from Angola, but it's it's just, uh, it's like like Rodin's finger made out of high heel shoes. <laughs> and the museum has asked me to make 3D prints from it so they can have small ones to in gift shop. <laughs> So that's, that's their way of spreading the, the knowledge. <laughs> I wish we could stay and continue this conversation for another three hours. I honestly do. This has been like the, just what I needed at this crunch point in the semester. It's been so wonderful talking with you all. But we have security guards that need to put their kids to bed and and students who need to study for finals. So we're gonna have to wrap it up, but I just wanna thank all, all of you uh, again, um, Willie and Hervé and also Corey for um, leading this great conversation. It's been a real honor to have you here. Please join me. <laughs>